the stage, serial tech entrepreneur and current co-founder of Bancor Protocol, uh, Galia Benarsi. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Galia, co-founder of Bancor Protocol. Um, today is actually our six month birthday, so it's, uh, it's fun to be here, thanks. Um, so I'd love to start presentations with this slide and this quote from Jim Daner. Any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous, right? It's the future. If it was easy to imagine, it would be the present. Um, this photo was taken in downtown Palo Alto, my hometown. I like to say I went to uh, middle school and high school with the internet. Um, and it's apropos as we talk about the new value internet or the internet of money known as blockchain, which we might say is currently in like elementary school. So uh, Yuval Harari in his pretty famous book, Sapiens, talks about one of the ways that human intelligence is different than animal intelligence or the other uh, creatures that we share this planet with. So we're actually similar in many ways, especially when we look at small groups. So in small groups, humans and also apes do a lot of similar things. We collaborate, we help each other, we share goods and services, apes groom each other. Um, it's when we get into bigger and bigger groups that we start to see this difference. Um, and Harari really talks about stories as the key fundamental difference in human intelligence and what makes humans so intelligent. Our ability to tell stories. Why does that matter? Because stories unite us. They unite us around common understandings and truly they allow us to collaborate on a massive scale. So if you think about putting 10,000 of those really nice collaborating, grooming each other apes together in Times Square, 10,000 of them or 100,000 of them, it's not gonna look good. You might see violence, you'll definitely see chaos. But if you put 100,000 people in Times Square, they don't know each other, they don't trust each other, but these stories that we tell each other allow us to collaborate, right? Stories like, don't go on a red light, go on a green light. Um, these are the stories that we tell each other that allow us to collaborate. So there are two real protocols that we like to think about when we think of human collaboration. One of them is information. We share information, right? We tell each other things. Um, information can be both verbal, digital, it can come in many formats. Um, and we share value. So this isn't to say that information isn't valuable, but these are two distinct protocols, and here's why. Information, when we share it, when we send it, I might send you a video, an image, a text, a document, a contract, you and I both now have it. Information can exist in multiple places at once. It's not corrupted when it's copied. Value, on the other hand, it's very important that you get the original. It's very important that when I give it to you, you have it, and I no longer have it. That's the essence of value. The internet that we know and love has been incredible for the sharing of the first type of information the kind that can be shared, distributed, copied, it's not essential to get the original in most cases. It hasn't yet been able to share the second kind of value that must be fundamentally in one place at one time. This is why we've needed other intranets, like the SWIFT system. We've needed banks and governments to essentially guard these ledgers and tell us where is the money? Where is the money now? or where is the sensitive information, whose account is whose. So what is money? Money is a tool for human collaboration. It's like our shared accounting system that lets us keep track of who's done what, who has what, who's giving what, and who's taking what in this kind of mass system of collaboration that we call modern society. We used to do this through barter, right? I had tomatoes, you had carrots, we'd meet at the town square or marketplace and we'd exchange. This leads us to a problem known in economics as the double coincidence of wants. It sounds fancy, but it's really simple. It means you have to have the thing I want and I have to have the thing you want at exactly the same time and place in order for us to trade. We used to have a double coincidence of wants even in information sharing. 
speaking, right? In order to hear the wisdom of someone in your community, you had to be at the square where they were speaking, or else you could hear it through the grapevine, but, but not in its original format. We invented writing, writing of course went digital, and now I can benefit from the wisdom of Plato or anyone else without being physically in the same time and place as when they spoke. In money, money is the tool that allows us to barter essentially over time and space. It solves this double coincidence of wants, right? So it separates the buying from the selling. I can sell my tomatoes now, and some other time if I happen to want carrots, I can buy carrots. Right? It's an efficient technology. I love this, uh, this comic that just helps illustrate how rare it is to actually find the person with the thing that you want that wants the thing that you have um, at the same time. So we invented money. Again, it's a tool, it's a human invention. And it, in its original format, its first era, as I like to call it, it came from the earth. Okay, money was something that you could point to, you could look at, we could agree generally on its value. Gold is valuable, it's rare, it's scarce, it's hard to mine from the earth. If you have a huge pile of gold, you either worked really hard for that gold or you worked really hard to get it from other people. We all know that the gold is valuable so we can use it for this common accounting system. Gold, silver, salt, oil, money came from the earth. In the second era of money, money comes from governments. Okay, and I mean this broadly to say governments, sometimes in private public partnerships with banks, but money is issued by our governing authorities who decide how much there is, who gets it, how much it costs, when we print more of it, right? This is a privilege that's reserved to the 200 or so central banks uh, around the world, or the 200 or so uh, sovereign governments around the world. This, by the way, is for its coin format, its paper format, and its digital format. And now we enter the most exciting era of money, money 3.0. So originally it came from the earth. Today it still comes, by and large, from governments. And now money can come from the people. It's a fundamental shift. The creators of Bitcoin, whoever he or she may be, are likely not a government, or presumably not a government. They're a group, maybe they're a company. They're definitely uh, a user in internet terms. They came from the people. Bitcoin, of course, was the first, but if you're familiar with the cryptocurrency space, there are tens, hundreds, thousands, and growing numbers of digital currencies out there. What makes any of these currencies valuable at all? Liquidity, right? The beauty of money, and in fact, the only reason we have money, is so that it can become what you want it to be at any given time. It must be liquid to the good or service that you want, or potentially liquid to other money that's liquid to the good or service that you want. I'd love to show this graph of Ethereum, one of the most popular cryptocurrencies after Bitcoin, um, which really shows the, the long, story that's been told here. So Ethereum issued its currency uh, a few years ago at a price of 30 cents. Today it's at 550, maybe by the time I got off the plane it's at 650, right? But this kind of astronomical rise that we're seeing in the past few days, weeks, months, even year, this is not sudden. This did not happen overnight. We have years here of flatlining, years of growth, years of telling a story that people can believe in, right? So the Ethereum story is the, is the story of the Ethereum platform, which is a smart contract-based platform. It lets us take computer code and put it on the blockchain so that it's immutable, it can't be changed, so that it's highly secure, it can't be hacked, right? That's a story that took time to build, still takes time, and will continue to take time to build. But I'd like to show this graph because we find ourselves today in a, in a quick flip environment, right? In a speculator's game, where we look at digital currencies, we look at assets, and we, we expect them to spike or we deem them worthless. And the truth about liquidity is that it pertains to the story of the currency. If you believe in the currency, it's liquid. And it takes time to build belief. 
So liquid currency is a valuable currency. This is the map of the currencies that today we consider liquid, right? The, the currencies of the sovereign nations. I'd like to take you back in time to uh, this place where the map of these currencies was drawn out, at least the modern version of it. Does anyone know where this is? So this is the Bretton Woods Hotel in Jefferson, New Hampshire. Uh, this is the site of the Bretton Woods Conference that took place right after World War II or at the end of World War II, where the leaders of 40 nations gathered or the, the treasury delegates from these nations gathered to redraw the financial map of the world after the destruction of World War II, right? Because if, if your map looks like the one that we just saw, uh, you need a liquidity strategy between these currencies. You need some kind of agreement between the nations. How will they accept each other's currencies? For how much? At what price? What happens if one country issues a ton of its currency? How do the other countries know, right? There's some kind of global financial framework that these currencies are working in in order to be predictably liquid. And so at this conference, uh, the heads of the financial world got together um, and there were two fundamental proposals that they weighed. The big question was, which currency of that map of currencies will be the global reserve currency, the international reserve currency? The one that will measure things in, the one that will price things in, the one that will trade against when we settle between our payments. So over here you have the USA and the UK and the Treasury Secretaries of both. Um, and these are the two proposals that were on the table for this specific question. Um, the USA, of course, wanted to use the US dollar as the global reserve currency. And the UK uh, had a different proposal, and it was called Bancor. The Bancor was meant to be a supranational currency, an intranational currency, not governed by any one nation. The man who proposed it, the economist John Maynard Keynes in this photo, said that if you used one nation's currency as the global reserve, you would be giving that country a liquidity advantage. Everyone would always want their currency. Their currency would always be liquid to everything else. Liquidity, as you remember, is value. Value is power. So we all know how this story played out. Um, of course, at the time, the US dollar was backed by gold, and so one of the predominant reasons to use the US dollars, and I'm putting politics aside here, was, listen, it's backed by gold. We can't just print it, we can't issue it, we can't manipulate it. Uh, there's a certain amount of it. If we were to print more of it, we'd have to amass more gold uh, to back it. Of course, 30 years later, the US dollar left the gold standard, and we have the system that we know today. To show this pic uh, that I took at the hotel. Um, this is the delegation uh, from America, group of nine men. Um, and then I fast forward to this group of men and women um, in 2014, about 60 years later. Uh, these are my co founders. Um, and in 2014, 2013, a couple years after discovering Bitcoin, we looked at this new paradigm and we said, you know, where there's one user generated content, there will be millions. And we started building apps and thinking about a world in which millions of user-generated currencies would be usable around the world. We piloted currencies with groups. Uh, these are called community currencies, and one of the most popular ones was called Hearts. Um, the Lev market had about 30,000 mothers uh, in the greater Tel Aviv area um, that received these hearts for joining the group. They received the hearts for other value-added actions that they performed in the community, like inviting other moms to join, volunteering at schools, um, helping with various things uh, throughout the community. And they could spend these hearts in a marketplace where all the moms and all the families uploaded the goods and services that they could let go of or that they could offer in exchange. In one year, we saw a tremendous amount of commerce between these families to the tune of about $24 million worth without one dollar or shekel changing hands, only hearts. And so we asked these moms, why weren't you doing this before? You know, all the goods were here and you guys were all here and we already have a money that does this, we have our national monies, why weren't you using that? And they told us very simply, we didn't have any of that. We didn't have any of that money. All of that money that we make is spent. We spend it on rent, we spend it on food, we spend it on taxes, we spend it on bills. 
Um, we spend it on the things that we need for our life and we have none of it left. We don't buy new toys for our kids. We don't get a birthday cake for our kids. We don't get a music tutor or other luxurious services for our children and for our families. We don't do that spending. Now that we have this hearts budget, we do. And these families experienced a tremendous amount of abundance. It was like a quantitative easing, right? Like an airdrop of money into a specific community uh, that could use it well amongst themselves. So why doesn't everybody do this? Why doesn't everybody make their own money? I remind you of this map, and I remind you of the liquidity problem, which is that if your currency isn't accepted outside of your community, it's not liquid, so it's not valuable. And what we saw in the Hearts community and in every other pilot that we ran, and we ran dozens of these all over the world and saw the same thing over and over, was that since none of these countries are accepting your hearts, over time your hearts lose their value. And not only are none of these countries accepting your hearts, but no communities within those countries are accepting your hearts either, except your own community. And if your community can't provide you with a full stack economy, right, everything you could ever need, without needing to import or export anything from another community, you are illiquid. So we looked at this problem, and we looked at what was happening in blockchain with smart contracts, and this new paradigm where you could program money. And we thought, what if you could make the money smarter? What if you could make the money itself smarter? What if you could solve the liquidity problem, and other problems that we have, by the way, directly through the currency smart contracts, directly through this code, which is immutable, which is on the blockchain, which can't be changed, which is easy to trust, which is very secure. What if? So the Bancorp protocol standardizes smart tokens. Here are a few of the reasons that we think they're smart. So these currencies are networked to each other. That was the approach we took in solving these problems. If you had not just one community of hearts, but millions of communities of hearts, and all of these millions of communities could accept each other's currencies, and you could spend your hearts in all of these millions of communities, you could create that critical mass of liquidity that would allow these user-generated currencies, these community currencies, complementary currencies, to even exist in the first place. So they're purchasable and sellable for the other tokens in the network. That's how the infrastructure works. When you buy them, the smart contracts issue them. They issue new units of them. And when you sell them, the smart contract destroys those units that you're selling back. So we actually have an adaptable money supply. We couldn't do this before. We, of course, have our governing bodies who issue more money at varying rates, at varying times, for varying reasons. This is math. This is a program. It's open source, it's transparent, and everyone knows how the money is coming into existence and how it's going out of circulation. Algorithmic pricing balances the conversion rates. I won't get into it too deeply, but check out our website if you want to learn more about the protocol specifically. And they're convertible directly between people. So you can send these smart tokens from your wallet to other people's wallets, and they can send them back to you. You don't need to match those buyers and sellers and exchanges anymore. You don't need to create that double coincidence of wants solving problem by matching a lot of people, by creating volume on a level that will allow you to find those matches. And, 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 and I say this because beyond Bancor, there are so many people out there working on how to make currency smart. And I bring you back to the problems that we have in our money system and to the solutions we could find if we could code them into the money. So this book, Rethinking Money by Bernard Leotard, really talks about how money and economic networks are like natural ecosystems. Okay, and natural ecosystems have a spectrum between resilience and efficiency. Right, some things are very efficient, 
um, like an animal that can eat all the other animals at a superior rate, that's an efficient animal. And on the other hand, you have resilience, right? An ecosystem that can regenerate itself if all of one species dies out. They can have a variety of food sources for each animal in the ecosystem. And you can imagine from there. And so he says that money uh, really works on the same spectrum, where you can have really efficient money, and this might be one money per country or one money for the world, that's really efficient. We'd all know how to price everything. We'd have no exchange rates. We'd all know what everything costs, more or less. It is quite efficient. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have resilience. So if every community had a money like hearts, we'd be incredibly resistant. If one community had a problem, there would be a variety of currencies nearby that they were already linked to, networked with, probably had some of, that they could rely on. And if you think about Greece and what's going on in Europe, this analogy becomes very clear, right? All the people are still in Greece, and all the factories are still in Greece, and all the economic potential is still in Greece. But because the euros have been removed from Greece, because the money is out of the system, the economy comes to a standstill. If there were other currencies that they could use which were liquid themselves, they might be able to jumpstart their solution even while the politicians debate. So Bernard really says that diverse and liquid currencies can finally achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Why? The UN estimates that we need about $4 trillion to end what it considers are uh, the main plagues of society. Poverty, uh, human trafficking, there, there are a few. Um, $4 trillion. Where are we going to get this $4 trillion? We're not. The countries are not going to give the world $4 trillion to solve its problems. We would love for them to do this, and it's unlikely that they will. Bernard and other proponents of community and complementary currencies think if we could use a system like this where communities and groups could issue their own currencies, we could print the $4 trillion ourselves. So this Reed's Law uh, that I present you with is one of the lesser known laws of the internet and I think it's one of the most interesting. Um, so I'll walk you through what you're looking at. In the old model, we had the broadcast model, right? So a TV station or a newspaper would send out information, and it's a one-way street, right? They send it to the people, the people consume it. That's what's happening. If we measure that network in terms of its members, it's a flat number. If there are n people who read the newspaper, there are n nodes in that network. n people who watch the TV station, n nodes in that network. Then we go to Metcalfe's Law, which says, if you allow all the members of your network to connect with each other, right, this is the advent of peer-to-peer -peer communications that we get with the internet, now you can measure the value of your network as n squared, right? Not only is there a one-way flow of information to every node in the network, but there's a potential flow of information from every node in the network to every node in the network. And this Reed's Law, called Group Forming Networks, talks about the next generation of interconnectivity, which is if you use these platforms to allow users to form their own groups within the platform, and you let all of these groups talk to each other, and all of the members talk to each other, now you can measure your network value with this sneaky exponential, two to the n. And as our networks grow, we can see the exponential rate of growth of a group forming network. So what's a group forming network? Think of a platform like YouTube, right? It doesn't just let everyone talk to each other and everyone broadcast their videos. It lets you form a channel that people can subscribe to. It lets channel owners discourse with each other, maybe cross-promote each other's channels, right? Everyone in each channel can speak with everyone in, in every other channel. So you have a group forming network. We see this with Facebook. Facebook is one huge group, right, of billions of people. But you can have your own little group within Facebook. And your little group within Facebook can communicate with, collaborate with, trade with other little groups in Facebook. You can co-host events. You can co-publish a paper. Um, you can co-fund an activity, right? And so you have this group forming network. And when we take some of these ideas and we map them to currencies, we think about this long tail. 
So if you can not only let users form and use their own digital currencies, but you can let groups form and create their own group currencies and allow these group currencies to be exchangeable, all one for the other, you'll see the longest tail that we've experienced yet, which is the long tail of user-generated value. And it will be measured in the trillions of trillions. Thanks, and please get in touch.